Welcome to Unit 6, Civil War, 1861 to 1865. By the end of this unit, you should be able to do the following. Explain the differences between the northern and southern states that divided Virginia leading to the Civil War. Explain the major events that divided Virginians leading to secession and the Civil War. Explain the creation of West Virginia. Describe Virginia's role in the war, including major battles. And lastly, describe the roles of American Indians, whites, enslaved African Americans, and freed African Americans. The following is important vocabulary for this unit. Industrialized means having an economy with many factories and businesses. Abolition is an end to all slavery. An abolitionist is a person who works to end slavery. Anti-slavery means against the spread of slavery. Agricultural is an economy based on farming. An armory is a place where weapons are made and or stored. Plantations are large farms that grow a lot of one major cash crop, such as tobacco or cotton. Secede means to withdraw from to pull out because of a difference of opinion. And Confederacy is another name for the Confederate States of America, the nation formed by 11 states that seceded from the United States. Real quick, let's recap where we left off in our previous units. George Mason had argued that the U.S. Constitution should end slavery. Westward migration brought up a divisive question do new states allow slavery? Eli Whitney's invention, the cotton gin, created a brand new industry. Let's take a quick look at the North versus the South before the Civil War. The North had an industrial economy. There were large paper and cloth mills, warehouses, and factories which provided hundreds of jobs to its citizens. There were also hundreds of small businesses like furniture and clothing stores. In the South, they had an agricultural economy. Here, slavery let landowners have a big workforce without having to pay employees. Tobacco is still Virginia's main crop at this time, although the cotton industry is booming due to the new cotton gin invented by Eli Whitney. As early as the 1780s, northern states began to do away with slavery. By 1830, all had done so. Black northerners began fighting for abolition all over the country, speaking for equal rights. Most white people in New England and the mid-Atlantic states didn't own slaves and therefore voted to end slavery in their home states. White people in the Midwest were anti-slavery in their own regions and in new territories to the West. Down South, Eli Whitney's cotton gin had changed the farming game. Cotton cloth was a welcome change from the hot, heavy wool that was used in the past. American Indians were forced from their homes into what became Oklahoma, and enslaved African Americans were forced further into the Deep South to pick cotton. Slaves labored in the fields, planting, picking, and cleaning cotton. Plantation owners would do anything to protect their fortunes. They relied on an enslaved workforce for planting and harvesting. The slaves rose with the sun and worked until dark no matter the weather. They were often beaten and whipped for working too slowly. Then, after dark, they would return to their meager homes to grow their own food and do their own household chores in time to get up the next morning and work on the plantation again. Some slaves risked death to earn their freedom, although others stayed and fought back. Between 1830 and 1850, hundreds of thousands of slaves were forcibly sent to the Deep South. By 1860, 4 million people were enslaved in the United States, and a growing number of whites opposed slavery. Nat Turner was a slave and a preacher in Southampton County, Virginia. In 1831, 
after waking up from a vivid dream about it, Turner led a revolt against Virginia's plantation owners, leading to the deaths of more than 50 white men. He was captured and executed, but it was too late. Virginia's white upper class feared that more slaves could do the same. A few weeks later, in 1832, the Virginia General Assembly met in Richmond, where two groups disagreed on the topic of slavery. One group, from mostly western counties, proposed a 30-year timetable for phasing out slavery. The other group, from the eastern part of the state, refused to consider an end. The proposal to end slavery was defeated, but the state was divided nonetheless. Henry Brown lost his family twice in his lifetime. First was when he was sold as a child in Louisa County after his master had died. He lost his family once again as an adult when his wife and their young children were sold out of state in 1848. At that time, he was living in Richmond, and he asked a white friend, Samuel A. Smith, and Smith's free black helper, James Smith, to box him up and ship him to freedom in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is how he earned his nickname, Henry Box Brown. Henry Box Brown and many others made their escapes using the Underground Railroad. This was not a train or a tunnel. It could be a series of safe houses, a secret trail through a misty swamp, or any method of travel, even a small crate like Henry Brown's, that led people from slavery in the South to freedom in the North. Maryland's Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass are some of the more famous travelers, but there were thousands of others. To stem the tide of escaping slaves, many Virginia slave owners called for a federal Fugitive Slave Act, which became law in 1850. It required Northerners to help capture runaway slaves. They weren't happy with this, so to fight back, several Northern states passed their own laws to protect the runaway slaves from recapture. As I previously said, Harriet Tubman escaped using this Underground Railroad. She escaped from her Maryland slave master in 1849. Instead of enjoying her freedom, she then risked her life countless times over the next decade to help family, friends, and at least 200 other slaves reach freedom. One important white abolitionist was John Brown. One October night in 1859, John Brown tried to start a slave rebellion when he led a group of men to the U.S. Armory in Harper's Ferry, Virginia, now located in West Virginia. The government's guns and ammunition were inside. His supporters, both black and white, planned to take the guns and start a slave rebellion. Unfortunately, his plan failed, but his capture, trial, and death by hanging caused an uproar. At this trial, he reminded everyone that the Bible they all swore upon in a court of law said, Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In 1820, the United States was equally divided between free and slave states. People in the North wanted slavery to end, but white Southerners wanted it to grow. Neither side could get exactly what they wanted, so they came up with the Missouri Compromise, which drew an imaginary line through the Louisiana Territory to decide which new states would be free and which would allow slavery. In the years that followed this decision, pro-slavery and anti-slavery forces continued to argue as what was known as the West moved farther West. In 1857, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Congress could not stop slavery from expanding. The case centered on Dred Scott, a Virginia-born slave whose owner had taken him into free territory for extended periods of time. Scott asked for his freedom, but the court ruled that he was still a slave and did not even have the right to go to federal court to seek his freedom. In 
Angered by the Dred Scott decision, a new political party, the Republicans, vowed to stop slavery from expanding into any new Western territories, even as it promised not to abolish slavery where it already was. The party's candidate in 1860, a tall, thin Midwesterner named Abraham Lincoln, was elected president. It's important to note that not all African Americans in Virginia or the other southern states were slaves. Some were born free because their mothers were free. Others were set free by their owners. And still others bought their freedom either by working at extra jobs to save money or with the help of free blacks who paid to buy family or friends out of slavery. However, just because free persons of color were not slaves didn't mean that they had the same freedoms as a white person, quite the opposite. They had to carry freedom papers with them wherever they went. Men couldn't vote, children couldn't go to school, and newly freed people of color had to leave the state within a year of gaining freedom unless they had special permission to stay. Free blacks could even be enslaved for a small infraction or kidnapped and sold back into slavery. Some Southerners feared that Lincoln would end slavery in the South. In December 1860, South Carolina decided to secede and soon six other Deep South states joined them. In February 1861, these southern states formed a new country, the Confederate States of America, with a capital in Montgomery, Alabama, and Jefferson Davis, a Mississippi planter and politician, as its president. Take a moment to observe this map and see what you notice. On April 1, 1861, Confederate soldiers attacked Fort Sumter, a federal fort in Charleston, South Carolina, in the early hours of the morning. It became the first battle of the Civil War. Afterwards, President Lincoln called on all states that hadn't seceded to send volunteer troops. Virginians faced a tough decision. At first, delegates voted two to one not to secede. However, the news came from Fort Sumter and they heard President Lincoln's request and there was a new vote. This time, the vote was two to one to join the Confederacy. On April 17, 1861, Virginia seceded, soon joined by North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas making 11 Confederate states in all. Four current slave states, Delaware, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri, stayed in the Union. Not all Virginians were happy with the decision to secede from the Union, though. After 30 years of quarreling between the eastern and western parts of the state, the western part of the state decided to break off in 1863, Congress recognized a new state, West Virginia, which joined the Union. Once the war started, Virginia was an absolute powerhouse. It was the biggest and wealthiest of the Confederate states and had factories where guns and other war materials could be made. It was home to some of the best military minds in America. Virginia was so important to the war effort that the Confederate capital was moved to Richmond, which quickly became the Confederate States of America's brains and heart. For four terrible years, the Civil War raged across America. Hundreds of thousands of people fought, suffered, and died. Much of the fighting took place in Virginia, especially in the area between the capital of the United States in Washington, D.C., and the Confederate capital in Richmond, Virginia. Virginia's decision to secede made it much harder for the Union to defeat the Confederacy, but it also meant that Virginia suffered enormously, with over 120 battles fought on Virginia soil. Whether they wore Union blue or Confederate gray, young soldiers fought to the death. 
Many were even buried in Virginia soil where they fell. Darkness came to homes across the land as fathers, sons, brothers, and husbands were reported dead. Northerners wondered if the United States could survive intact. From the first battle cries to the last hurrah, Virginia was at the heart of the fighting. The first battle of Bull Run took place on July 21, 1861. The Battle of Fredericksburg took place on December 13, 1862, and the Battle of Hampton Roads on March 8th through the 9th, 1862. First, let's take a look at the First Battle of Bull Run. It was the first major land battle of the war and took place in Northern Virginia. Sweating in their heavy woolen uniforms, about 35,000 Union soldiers began their march west, away from Washington, D.C., toward some 22,000 Confederate troops. The fight began near Manassas Junction, where two railroads met near a creek named Bull Run. At one point, it seemed that the Union would win, but when thousands of new Confederate troops arrived from farther west, the promising Union victory turned into a terrible defeat. Taking into account the dead, wounded, and missing, Union casualties topped 2,700 men. Confederate losses were almost as bad at just under 2,000 men. Those numbers seemed enormous, but they only hinted at the staggering loss of life that was to come. The next summer, from August 28th through the 30th, 1862, war came back to Manassas this time on an even larger scale. The total number of soldiers, Union and Confederate combined, topped 100,000 men. In the end, Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his troops won a huge victory at the Second Battle of Manassas, but it cost him dearly. When the fighting at Second Manassas was over, about 16,000 Un Union troops were dead or wounded, along with 9,000 Confederate casualties. The Confederate Army of Northern Virginia handed Union troops one of their worst defeats of the war at the Battle of Fredericksburg on December 13, 1862. The Union Army suffered huge casualties during this battle. The last Virginia battle that we are going to look at is the Battle of Hampton Roads, on March 8th through the 9th, 1862. It took place right here in Virginia waters near Norfolk and Hampton. It was one of the fiercest sea battles of the Civil War. There, two ironclad ships forever changed naval history when the Merrimack, which was a Confederate ship, began shelling the Monitor, a Union ship, to try to end a Union blockade. These were the first ships armored with iron to fight in battle. The battle between the two ships ended in a draw. When the war first began, many people thought the Union had a big advantage. They had far more white men available to become soldiers than the Confederacy. But that didn't matter. The South's leaders believed that if they followed in George Washington's footsteps, avoiding any major losses while constantly staying on the attack, they would eventually wear the North down and win the war. As well, Virginians were fighting on their own turf, protecting their own homes. Their slaves were pressed into service on the battlefront to, to do much of the support work so that the soldiers could focus on the fighting. On the home front, slaves grew corn to feed the soldiers, and deep south slaves grew the cotton that clothed them, freeing white men to go into battle. Still, northern states felt that they had the advantage. The north had far more factories to produce war goods than the south did. It also had a strong navy which could blockade southern ports to keep shipments from arriving, the North also had many more men available to fight. This war dragged on for four miserable years, 
During that time, over 600,000 men died in the fighting. If you add up the death tolls of every other war that Americans have ever fought in, from the American Revolution to the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, you will have about the same number of soldiers dead as were lost in America's Civil War. It was, and still is, our nation's greatest tragedy. Now let's take a look at some of the important historical figures from this time period. Thomas Stonewall Jackson was one of the finest Confederate generals of the Civil War. He earned his nickname when someone described him as standing like a stone wall in the thick of the First Battle of Bull Run. He acted heroically during the South's great victory at Manassas, inspiring his troops. And at the Battle of Chancellorville in 1863, he was accidentally shot by his own men and died a week later. Had he lived, the Confederacy would have had a better chance of victory. Hiram Ulysses Grant never wanted to be a soldier, but he went to West Point anyway because that was what it was expected of him. On his application, his name was incorrectly recorded as Ulysses Simpson Grant, and the new name stuck. When the Civil War began, Grant took charge of a volunteer regiment and soon had the men in fighting shape. For his hard work, he was promoted again and again, and he began winning more battles, and eventually, in 1862, he became a major general of the Union's volunteer soldiers. Grant ordered most of his troops to head deep into the South, where he led a rapid series of brutal battles, leading his Army of the Potomac to a final showdown with General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. Their fight would end with the fall of Richmond. Robert E. Lee was born into a military family. He graduated second in his class at West Point and went on to have a fine military career. He was Abraham Lincoln's first choice to head the Union Army, but he chose to remain loyal to his birthplace, Virginia. Lee was America's finest military leader at the time, defeating Union troops at the Second Battle of Bull Run, the Battle of Fredericksburg, and many others. But after years of fighting, the Confederacy's resources, its men, money, and materials were running out. After several major losses, Lee knew he could no longer hope to win. Rather than sacrifice even more soldiers, he chose to surrender to Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia. Lee's punishment was the loss of the home his wife, the great-granddaughter of Martha Washington, had inherited. Today, that home, the Custis Lee Mansion, and the land around it is the final resting place for thousands of American soldiers, the sacred soil of Arlington National Cemetery. So we know about the famous soldiers, but what was life like for the average soldier? In between days of fighting were days of boredom, friendship, fear, and often death from diseases. Men slept together in small tents. Bugles blasted at first light, and days were spent doing drills, marching, or simply standing at attention. There were many chores, firewood to gather, roads to build, and outdoor toilets to dig. Sometimes, officers, wives, and children came along. Most days, meals were the same. Salt pork, beans, cornbread, and hardtack, a tough, often bug-infested biscuit. Like Robert E. Lee, most white Virginians supported the Confederate cause. Some fought to preserve slavery, others fought for glory, and some simply hoped to protect their families or farms. But there were many ways to support the Confederacy besides aiming a gun at an enemy. Everyone had something important to gain or lose. Across the South, free and enslaved Blacks and Indians often felt pressured to act like they wanted a Confederate victory. On the home front, Black Virginians, men, women, and children, grew corn and raised cattle to feed Confederate soldiers. 
large numbers of black Virginia men, both enslaved and free, were drafted to provide combat support on the battlefront where they transported supplies, cooked meals, and built fortifications, a defensive wall to, built to strengthen a place against attack. Black Virginians worked in the factories and kept the railroads running. As for house slaves, many a white man from a plantation went to war accompanied by his body servant. White Virginians gave everything they had to make good on the gamble for their new nation. Women knitted socks and made bandages, taught school, worked in factories, raised and comforted their children, and kept farms and plantations running. Another group that we need to consider are the Virginia Indians. Most Virginia Indians tried to keep out of what they called the white man's war. They had no love for the Confederates' cause. After all, they had suffered at the hands of Virginia landholders and politicians. Like African Americans, they were considered people of color and had to carry freedom papers. But the war came right through Indian country, including the Pamunkey and Mattaponi reservations. Fourteen Indians from the Tidewater regions, knowing the area very well, were a big help to the Union Army as river guides, land guides, and spies. The war affected African Americans in a huge way. Throughout 1863 and 1864, as Union armies marched into Virginia, slaves threw down their shovels and hoes and joined the marching throng. Men of military age enlisted and proudly put on blue uniforms as U.S. soldiers, ready to fight and save the Union and end slavery. The Union Army and Navy welcomed African Americans, but at first only let them do combat support work, much like their black Confederate counterparts. But in time, more and more were trained to become combat ready. The Army formed special units called the United States Colored Troops, led by white officers. In March 1865, Lee made a last-ditch effort to avoid defeat. He convinced the Confederate Congress to permit enslaved men to become soldiers and free men, if their state and their owner agreed. But it was too late. In a few short weeks, the final battles of the war would be waged. Parts of the city of Richmond would be burned to the ground, and the terrible days of slavery would finally come to an end. In order to win the war, Lincoln had to do something about slavery. All those slaves forced to work on both the home front and the battlefield were a huge advantage to the Confederacy. But what could Lincoln do? He issued a warning to the Confederacy that if by January 1st, 1863, they had not rejoined the Union, he would issue a proclamation freeing the slaves. That is what happened. The states chose not to rejoin the Union, so on January 1st, 1863, he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring slavery abolished in any parts of the Confederacy that had not come back under the control of Union armies. Thousands of slaves left the South's plantations and volunteered to serve in the Union Army. That brings us to the fall of Richmond. We must capture Richmond had been the goal of the Union Army since the start of the Civil War. And even though the Confederate capital was only 100 miles from Washington, D.C., the Union Army's journey to get there took four long years. On April 2nd, 1865, that all changed. Word came to Richmond that the Confederate defenses protecting Petersburg were falling. General Lee's army was retreating as General Grant's men drew closer. Richmonders began setting fire to their warehouses, and within minutes, flames ripped through the city center and gunpowder stored near the James River waterfront exploded. They feared that if they lost control of the city, a vast amount of the supplies 
would fall into the hands of the Union Army. At dawn on April 3rd, Union troops entered the charred ruins of Richmond. Black troops as well as white, soldiers from across the nation, all stood amidst the sooty wreckage of the Confederate capital. Could the Confederacy last much longer? With much of Richmond destroyed and much of the South in ruins, General Lee knew the end had come. So on April 9, 1865, Lee's aide carried a white flag through the lines to tell General Grant that Lee was ready to surrender. During the four years of war, more than 600,000 men had died in blue uniforms and gray of diseases in the camps or wounds on the battlefield. This awful war with its many names, the war between the states, the war to free the slaves, the lost cause, the war against Northern aggression, the war of the rebellion, and the Brothers War led to the end of slavery and the fall of wealthy Southern planters. The South would remain poor for many years to come, but the war's end was also the beginning of a new way of life for Americans and for America. Lee had surrendered his army knowing the Confederacy could not win. But even at the end of April 1865, many questions still had no answers. How would a political reunion work? Could the former Confederate states simply send their congressmen back to the U.S. Capitol instead of to Richmond? Slavery was abolished across the South, but what would happen to all the newly freed slaves? Would they be citizens? Would African American men be allowed to vote? What would happen next? On April 9, 1865, at 1.30 in the afternoon, Robert E. Lee and Ulysses S. Grant sat down at the McLean House in Appomattox Courthouse, a small town near Lynchburg, Virginia. Lee wore a clean dress uniform. Grant still wore his muddy field clothes. As Lee read Grant's terms of surrender, he was surprised. His Army of Northern Virginia would not be paraded through the streets of Washington like criminals. His officers would not be sent to jail for treason. His soldiers could keep their horses and were all free to go home in peace. America's long nightmare was coming to an end. Make no mistake, our country's troubles were far from over. In our next unit, we will look at Reconstruction, the struggles of the South to rebuild, and racism that still permeated every inch of the United States. But the country was no longer divided, and the Union made a huge gesture in allowing the South to peacefully rejoin the United States instead of giving huge punishments.